Chapter 10 Securitization Part of the hype about blockchain has centered around the potential capability of blockchain to securitize almost anything. Proponents theorize that real-world assets can be represented on a blockchain and ownership of these assets can thus be divided and then traded by disparate parties around the world. The most obvious candidate for securitization would be real estate. Currently, stock exchanges around the world already have ETFs, Exchange Traded Funds, and REITs, Real Estate Investment Trusts, supported by underlying real estate assets underpinning the value of their shares. However, these assets are limited to certain exchanges and it's not simple to trade them internationally. If a blockchain solution is implemented, each unit of a certain cryptocurrency could be legally tied to ownership of an underlying real estate asset, much like a share. However, the mobile nature of blockchain would mean that not only would it be possible for an owner to move his shares off the exchange to a paper wallet or a brain wallet, but they could also trade them directly with other potential owners without the need for an intermediary exchange that takes commissions. A number of entrepreneurs are currently working on blockchain asset solutions that hold great promise. As more and more assets get digitized, markets can become considerably more liquid as it becomes possible for asset owners to very easily diversify their asset holdings to reduce risk. This is demonstrated by the previous example from an earlier chapter of a homeowner who liquefies 40% of the ownership of his home, selling it to outside investors while paying rent that finances dividends for investors for the use of the portion the investors have purchased. He could use the proceeds to invest in another geographical location or in a higher yield business or in an investment that ordinarily he wouldn't have the opportunity to do with his equity tied up in his home. Of course, digitizing assets doesn't come without drawbacks and certain hurdles to overcome. The Bitcoin blockchain is based on the digital world. It's purely digital and that's its strength. This is why it's so difficult to track Bitcoin and confiscate Bitcoin. As long as the private keys are out of sight in a brain wallet, there's no way for a hostile regime like the Nazis in pre-war Germany to extract the private keys from one of their citizens, especially if they are unaware of its existence. But again, digitizing assets, however, does have a weakest link, the bridge to the physical realm. For a digital currency to successfully represent a real physical asset in the digital world, it needs to be backed up by laws and legal frameworks that support the currency owner's claim to ownership. Real estate assets that have been digitized to the blockchain can still be confiscated by a hostile army at gunpoint. A motorbike that has been digitized onto the blockchain can still be stolen by a petty thief in the night. So while the advantages of digitizing assets, like increased liquidity, are many, it is by no means the key to a post-apocalyptic, lawless, libertarian world in the way that Bitcoin is believed to be by many of its supporters. Nevertheless, the idea of using the blockchain for real estate assets does still hold appeal because it does address several challenges that investors in real estate face. For starters, the conveyance of real estate is not very liquid. Every real estate transaction requires an army of middlemen facilitating the transaction to make sure it's valid, including the notary public, the registrar, the town clerk, the court, the bailiff, the title company, the agent, the broker, the escrow, the surveyor, the insurance company, and various other authorities. And this makes real estate transactions expensive as a result. The illiquidity also creates a time lag in terms of price discovery, so it's always difficult to estimate the current price of real estate when there isn't a stock market type mechanism that facilitates the trade between interested parties. Blockchain integration into real estate could conceivably create a much more liquid market with buyers and sellers interacting instantaneously in real time just as they are currently able to do with shares on the stock markets of the world. Critics of the digitized asset ideal can perform a litmus test for whether an asset can be digitized on the blockchain or not. Can an ordinary database perform the same function as well as a blockchain? If the answer to this question is no, then perhaps using a blockchain is inappropriate for the specific application. Other questions also need to be answered, like what happens when a blockchain security is sent to an incorrect address, or if the private keys holding coins for a particular asset are misplaced, lost, or stolen. In this case, the immutability of the blockchain, in many aspects its greatest feature, becomes a problem. 
Can someone to whom coins representing a certain asset were mistakenly sent be compelled by a court order to return those coins to the rightful owner? And even if they are legally ordered to do so, is there any way that a court can enforce this order? Moreover, in the case where the keys for an asset are mistakenly lost, how does the rightful owner recover them? Can they initiate a consensus-based hard fork of the blockchain that only reallocates the coins locked in their particular wallet? This kind of scenario occurred when the US dollar pegged cryptocurrency stablecoin called Tether was hacked and $30 million worth of tokens were sent to the hackers' wallets. The proprietors immediately instituted a hard fork that locked off access to the affected wallets. In a truly decentralized mass adopted currency with thousands of nodes like Bitcoin or Ethereum, this kind of consensus based hard forking is extremely difficult to achieve cleanly. Note what happened to Bitcoin Cash and Ethereum Classic, as detailed in earlier chapters. Thus it seems that real-world asset-based coins could only mimic blockchain functionality to a certain extent, but not be a pure blockchain in the orthodox sense, as this would limit their real-world functionality. However, these semi-blockchains can still provide useful services to cryptocurrency investors that want to diversify their portfolios. They also have the potential of providing huge economic benefits by providing liquidity to sectors of the economy that have never experienced any degree of financial liquidity. The regulation of blockchain-based securities has been playing a game of catch-up after the 2017 ICO boom that shocked the world. The US-based SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, has been ratcheting up its regulatory framework especially seen as over 90% of the ICOs until now have been either scams or gone bust and become inactive, segregating investors into accredited or sophisticated and unaccredited or unsophisticated categories is supposedly done under the guise of protecting the minnows from the sharks in the ocean while the whales supposedly can fend for themselves. However, effectively what it also does is prevent most unsophisticated ordinary investors from gaining exposure to higher risk, higher return opportunities to which only the wealthy are privy. Thus the rich get richer while everything stays the same for the ordinary man. This is also visible in the unicorn startup world where only VC firms can be exposed to the latest web early stage funding round, the next Pinterest or Amazon. Currently, these early startup firms have to run up and down Sand Hill Road in Palo Alto, knocking on all the doors of the VCs based there, begging for seed funding for their great ideas. However, the securitization of companies provides an avenue for crowdfunding that never existed before. By providing equity on the blockchain, early stage companies are essentially able to IPO before they even have the foundation stone for their company laid. While this means a lot of ideas that previously may not have been funded can now get off the ground much easier, it also means that a lot of great ideas with founders who aren't good at executing are also getting funded. And they're getting funded a lot. Some of the largest ICOs of 2017 and 2018 raised hundreds of millions of dollars, literally hundreds of millions of dollars before they had even launched a product. Hence the massive failure rate of poorly vetted ICOs. Unfortunately, to some degree, the SEC is right in determining that unsophisticated investors are unsophisticated. But does this mean that unsophisticated investors should forever be insulated from the home run opportunities that exist in the world today, to which only VCs, rich, sophisticated investors and the like can gain exposure? Or is it a case of helicopter parenting? Perhaps it's actually the latter. Much like a child that doesn't develop independence in the shadow of an overly doting grandparent who is forever picking them up from the ground before they have the opportunity to stand on their own two feet, the nanny state in which we live has not allowed unsophisticated investors to develop an understanding of evaluating investments in real-world conditions. 2017 has just been the first wave of a new ocean of opportunities for blockchain securitization of projects. The carnage has been great with many unsophisticated investors poorly evaluating projects surrounded in media hype and not doing the required due diligence that these projects require. However, the consequential learnings have been necessary to teach a new class of investor when to jump in and when to step back and take a breath and evaluate. 
In the long run, hopefully, this will create a more abundant world where entrepreneurs have easier access to funding to propel their ideas, and ordinary investors have more access to the abundance of opportunities that exist in the world. However, the SEC for the moment isn't willing to allow such rampant, unregulated financial innovation. As the SEC tries to get control of the market, proprietors of ICOs are starting to realize that a certain amount of regulation is necessary, particularly if their coin fails the Howey test. In fact, if the investment opportunity is open to many people, the investors have little to no control or management over the investment money or assets, the investment is money in a common enterprise, there are expectations of profits from the investment, and the profits come mainly from the efforts of a promoter or third party, then it's likely that this is a security under the Howey test. In particular, in regard to the Howey test, the SEC is concerned with security tokens, tokens that represent ownership of some underlying asset and thus come under the jurisdiction of these existing securities investment laws that have governed securities until now. As such, dozens of ICOs are currently under investigation for securities law violations. So while many idealistic libertarian ICO proprietors thought they were above the law, it seems that there's a new sheriff in town reigning in all the lawlessness. However, much like the anarchy that took over during the illegal file-sharing craze of the late 90s and early 2000s, if enough people are doing the wrong thing, pretty soon law enforcement can be completely overwhelmed and forced to take a different tack. Add undetectable or untraceable cryptocurrency financial settlement for funding securities into the mix, and law enforcement will more than have their hands full. 2017 was just like the first year of Napster. We haven't seen the last of the unregulated ICOs. Much like how the music industry had to adjust to the new realities brought on by file sharing and eventually reinvent itself, likewise the finance and equities industries are going to face serious obstacles as they seek to reinvent themselves in order to stay relevant. In regard to the stock exchange industry, this is particularly obvious as the NASDAQ and ASX, Australian Stock Exchange, are already experimenting with various implementations of blockchain technologies on their own platforms. Thus, while it seems that the SEC has retained some semblance of control for the time being over the ICO juggernaut, much more is still in the pipeline and regulators will be facing more and more challenges in the future. In the meantime, this means that ICO proprietors need to remain wary of international securities legislation or end up on the wrong side of the law as recipients of fairly hefty white-collar prison sentences. In the meantime, from the SEC's perspective, operating legally means acquiring all of the relevant licenses required to offer a securities token, be that Regulation S compliance for overseas exclusive offerings, or Regulation A compliance for US domestic market inclusive offerings at extra cost. Alternatively, if a security doesn't get tripped up by the Howey test, then it's generally regarded to be a utility token that is another method of fundraising that doesn't imply ownership of any underlying asset. The utility tokens are bought with the understanding that at some point in the future, when the ICO project has gained traction and goes online, the goods or services offered will only be purchasable using those particular tokens. Thus, the utility tokens are predicted to gain in value given the token scarcity and increasing anticipated future popularity of the given project. For example, Binance token is a limited quantity token issued by a Binance cryptocurrency exchange that's used exclusively for paying trading commissions on Binance. Investors betting on the future popularity of the Binance exchange have purchased tokens, believing they will be able to sell them to future users of the exchange for a profit. ICO regulation is still very unclear and lawmakers still haven't got their heads around the whole concept that underlies them, let alone tackled the legal minefield that encompasses their ownership and use. However, the proof of ownership that tokens provide means that the future is likely to be filled with more and more projects that are seeking funding through this revolutionary finance mechanism. Next episode of WTF is Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency and blockchain guide for dinner parties, We'll be reading Chapter 11, Stablecoins, and we'll focus on the different methodologies for creating and maintaining digital assets with stable values that hold the fungible properties of purely digital cryptocurrencies without the associated volatility and valuations. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't hesitate to like, comment, subscribe, and share this podcast with anyone you think will enjoy it. It really helps us reach a much larger audience. <laughs>